to protect their customers and employees and to slow the spread of the virus. By April 2020, the number of active small business owners had dropped by 22%, almost the holder of our crisis for the most significant drop on record in our nation's entire history. Since the dire situation emerged, members of the committee have worked tirelessly in a bipartisan fashion to get small businesses the relief that they need to stay afloat, to keep the lights on. In March of 2020, Congress created the PPP program, the Paycheck Protection Program, and the COVID-19 EIDL program that on record in our nation's entire history. Provide small businesses with forgivable or low interest loans to help them make it through the pandemic. But for many small business owners, too many small business owners, including many in the district that I represent and have spoken with on many occasions, taking on additional debt was not feasible during these uncertain times. This was especially true of businesses in the entertainment and hospitality sectors that had their entire business model disrupted by the pandemic. Recognizing the need for alternative relief options, Congress and this very committee have worked to provide direct economic relief to small firms that can't afford to weigh down their balance sheets with additional debt. For today's hearing, I'd like to focus on two major programs that Congress designed to reach the hardest hit small businesses in some of the most impacted sectors of the economy. Uh, the Shuttered Venue Grant Operator Program and the Restaurant Re Revitalization Fund are two programs that launched in 2021 and will deliver up to $50 billion in relief to small firms. This has been a monumental task by any measure for the SBA, and I'd like to impress upon all of us today that Congress and the SBA have worked hard to ensure that struggling small businesses do have access to this unprecedented direct financial support. I hope that by taking a closer look at these programs, we can gain a better understanding of the challenges that federal grant programs face, as well as the important relief that the programs are providing to struggling small business owners across the country. The SBOG uh, provided the SBA with $15 billion in grants to various entities across the hard hit events industry uh, that could demonstrate revenue loss. The implementation of SBOG was no small task for SBA, of course, and as we examine the program, it is essential to consider the complexity in launching a brand new federal grant program of that size and magnitude and that expeditiously. Uh, unlike other programs, SBOG required that the SBA create an effective program for both for-profit and nonprofit eligible entities that often have different revenue generation and accounting systems. So I do hope today's hearing allows us to explore benefits that businesses are hoping to receive from the SBOG and find ways to help the SBA administer the program effectively, efficiently, and get relief to struggling entities expeditiously. As COVID continues to wreak havoc on the dining and hospitality sectors, uh, earlier this year in particular, Congress stepped in and delivered much needed relief through the Restaurant Revitalization Fund. The RRF provided almost $30 billion, $28.6 billion, uh, to the SBA for grants to qualifying food and beverage establishments. Uh, the program also took steps to ensure that funds reach the most vulnerable small businesses in the country, including instituting a $5 billion set aside for small firms with less than $500,000 in gross receipts and an initial 21-day prioritization period for women, veteran, and underserved small businesses. These measures proved to be an effective way at getting aid to small businesses that have been neglected during previous relief efforts and have borne the brunt of the pandemic. As of May 20th of this year, over half of all applicants of RRF were women, veterans, and socially and economically disadvantaged business owners. On May 18th, SBA announced that RRF had distributed $6 billion to nearly 38,000 applicants. At the same time, they reported that RRF received 303,000 applications with a total demand of more than $69 billion. So without additional funding uh, for this program, Eligible entities requesting billions of dollars in need for relief are going to go unfulfilled. And it's those that we have in mind today. Since the beginning of the pandemic, members of this committee have worked to improve relief programs to meet the needs of small businesses and get relief to those who need it the most. So I hope today's hearing allows us to explore these programs' challenges and triumphs and uh, steps that this committee can take to improve both. Uh, with that, I will now yield to our ranking member for her opening statement. So Ms. Van Dyne. Thank you very much, Chairman Phillips. Good afternoon. Uh, thank you all for taking the time to be with us to discuss the SBA's grant program, specifically the Shuttered Venue Operators Grant and the Re Restaurant Revitalization Fund programs. 
I'm looking forward to hearing your thoughts as to how we can improve both of these programs. In the early days of 2020, as the COVID-19 pandemic took hold of the American economy, Congress and the Trump administration worked collaboratively and expediently to establish the Paycheck Protection Program, or PPP, and fortify the Economic Injury Disaster Loan Program, or EIDL. Within weeks, much needed funds were being delivered to our nation's smallest, employer, smallest employers to keep their employees on the payroll, pay their mortgage, and keep their lights on. And through no fault of their own, small business owners' livelihoods were destroyed and the businesses they had invested their entire life towards were forced to shut. The state and local public health mandates necessitated the swift actions taken by Congress and the Trump administration to keep our smallest employers alive. At the end of 2020, Congress passed and President Trump signed the Consolidated Appropriations Act for fiscal year 2021. And included in this legislation was the F SVOG program that was designed to provide grants to small businesses that rely on mass gatherings and thus experienced severe hardships during COVID-19. Unfortunately, the Biden administration waited until early April to implement this program, and even worse, when it did launch, the SBA portal crashed, forcing the SVOG program to cease operations the very same day it opened on April 8th. The SBA has since reopened the program, but much needed funding has yet to reach these hard hit businesses. Earlier this year, Congress passed the so-called American Recovery Plan Act of 2021. And due to the amount of unnecessary spending and bitter bipartisans or bitter partisanship included in this legislation, it was forced through Congress using the budget reconciliation process, which required a simple majority in both chambers and very little collaboration. There's one thing the plan got right. It created the RRF, which is a lifeline to struggling restaurants across the nation. Unfortunately, while the program had Republican support, it was crafted with zero Republican input. And in fact, during the Small Business Committee markup of the reconciliation package, Republican committee members offered several amendments, including ones that would have doubled funding for the RRF and made it more accessible to all small restaurants. We were unable to garner a single Democratic vote not a single one. And why is this important? The RRF is now out of money and only certain small businesses have been able to apply for it successfully. We'll hear from one of my constituents on the panel who's done everything right from the beginning, utilizing existing programs to keep his employees on the payrolls, bills paid and lights on. He submitted his application to the RRF as soon as possible, working through the process exactly as it was designed. It's been weeks and he still hasn't heard back and this is unacceptable. As we move forward, we absolutely must find these choke points that are leaving our small businesses twisting in the wind. They deserve better. They deserve bipartisan solutions that will work because they did during the early days of the pandemic. And finally, we must ensure that we utilize these dollars, taxpayer dollars, not free money, to as efficiently as possible. Vigorous oversight of these programs by our subcommittee is critical as we move forward. I was incredibly proud to take a step in that right direction this week by partnering with Chairman Phillips and six other members of the Small Business Committee to introduce the Restaurant Recovery Fairness Act, which would provide the vital oversight we're talking about for the Restaurant Revitalization Fund. I look forward to more collaborative oversight actions by this committee as we continue to stamp out fraud and abuse and make sure our funds are going where they're needed the most. I look forward to more collaborative oversight as we stamp out fraud and abuse and make sure that our resources are going to the small employers that need it the most. And again, thank you all for being with us. I look forward to today's discussion and I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Van Dyne. And now I'll just take a moment to explain how the hearing will proceed. Uh, each witness is gonna have five minutes to provide a statement and each committee member will have five minutes for questions. Uh, please ensure that your microphone is on once again when you begin speaking and that you return to mute when you're finished. Uh, with that, I'd like to introduce our witnesses. Uh, starting with our first, uh, Ms. Chidi Kumar, the chef and owner of Garland, a restaurant in Raleigh, North Carolina. Ms. Kumar is a self-taught cook who studied recipes while perusing uh, a career as a musician. Uh, in addition to Garland, Ms. Kumar is also the owner of the music venue, Kings, and the cocktail lounge, Neptune's Parlor. She's been nominated for the James Beard Award, Best Chef of the Southeast from 2017 to 2020, and was a finalist in 2020. So we welcome you, Ms. Kumar. Uh, our second witness is Ms. Esther Baru, the Director of Government Relations for the National Association of Theater Owners. 
In this capacity, she works with theater, theater owners and operators and directs federal and state policy strategy. Ms. Baru has been working closely with theater owners and public health officials in addressing the theater industry's response to the pandemic. And we thank you for joining us, Ms. Baru. Our third witness, a man after my own heart, who's got the best background, I think, in Zoom history, <laughs> and a Minnesota Gopher banner behind him, is Chris Montana, the owner and CEO of Dunord Craft Spirits, located in my district in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, Mr. Montana started Dunord as a family business, bringing together his experience growing up in Minneapolis with his wife Chanel's rural upbringing uh, on a Cold Spring, Minnesota farm. Uh, Dunord is committed to diversifying the craft alcohol community and actively recruits underrepresented people to join the Dunord family. I appreciate you joining us, Chris, and uh, welcome you as well. Uh, with that, I'll turn it back over to our ranking member, Ms. Van Dyne, to introduce our final witness. Thank you. Our final witness is Mr. Mark McGuire, owner of three very popular eateries, including one restaurant and two cafes in the North Dallas area, two of which are in my district, Texas 24. And I wish you had a more exciting background there, Mark, but maybe next time. <laughs> <laughs> After starting and managing several successful entertainment businesses across the country, Mr. McGuire was hired by Walt Disney World Company to lead the team that launched the Pleasure Island Entertainment Complex, which included two restaurants. Several successful restaurant and entertainment endeavors later, he was ready to strike out on his own, and in 1999, he opened McGuire's Regional Cuisine in Dallas. He's been a staple of the North Dallas community ever since. Mr. McGuire has served on a number of nonprofit boards, including the North Texas Food Bank and Hunger Busters. He has been heavily involved in restaurant advocacy and has served as a director and officer in the Texas Restaurant Association for over 20 years, including Dallas president and Texas president. Today, Mr. McGuire is testifying on behalf of the National Restaurant Association. Mr. McGuire, we welcome your participation at today's hearing. Thank you. All right, and with that, uh, we will begin today's hearing by recognizing Ms. Kumar for five minutes for your uh, statement. Chairman Phillips, uh, Ranking Member Van Dyne, and members of the subcommittee, thank you for inviting me to talk about the successful launch of the Restaurant Revitalization Fund and the need independent restaurants still have for help. Let me start by thanking Chairman Phillips and Chair Velasquez for all the support you have shown independent restaurants throughout this pandemic. I am the chef and co-owner of Garland in Raleigh, North Carolina, and in the same building as our restaurant is our music venue um, and basement cocktail bar. I immigrated from India to the Bronx at the age of eight and eventually settled in the South here in Raleigh to play music and open my restaurant. My story is not very different from so many others in the restaurant industry. Women, minorities, single parents, veterans, and so many others get their start in restaurants, build their lives in restaurants, and make a career working in restaurants. Frankly, restaurants represent America more than any other industry. Last March, I joined the then newly formed Independent Restaurant Coalition, which was a group of chefs and independent restaurant owners who have built a nationwide grassroots movement to secure vital protections for the nation's half a million independent restaurants and the more than 11 million restaurant and bar workers impacted by the coronavirus pandemic. Since then, we have advocated for a standalone restaurant grant program to help recover some of the estimated $280 billion in losses sustained by our industry because of the pandemic. We want to help save our employees and their families, to help make our suppliers and landlords whole, and most of all, to save restaurants. I'm proud that our small restaurant survived this far in the pandemic. We have cut, crimped, pivoted, closed, opened, closed again, open again, pivoted again, done takeout, served an outdoor sidewalk patio through the winter and a myriad of other things to get this far. Both rounds of the Paycheck Protection Program funding helped us to get through. We were closed for weeks last spring and did not do hot takeout through the summer, but instead pivoted to launch a prepared meal program so that we could make sure my staff was able to work safely. Frankly, as terrified as I was for my business, I value people and, and their health over commerce. We have been able to stay open and provide more jobs because of the help we received. Without that help, Garland, Neptune's Parlor, and Kings would be lost to the history of Raleigh. But Congress and the administration threw us a lifeline, and I'm here to ask that you do the same for every independent restaurant in America to ensure we do not have an extinction event. We're not out of the woods yet. 15 months of losses will not be recouped by a few weeks of full indoor dining capacity. For restaurants like ours, this pandemic is not over by a long shot. 
The RRF experience was really smooth for me. I applied on the first day and got word about our acceptance a couple of weeks later. I was lucky most of my financials were straightforward and the guidance was spot on for me. I know others have not been as lucky, but I'm also happy to report that the SBA has been working hard to treat everyone fairly and equitably during this process. The SBA closed the RRF application portal after three weeks of overwhelming demand. As of this week, over 370,000 restaurants and bars have applied, requesting over $79 billion in funds. 208,000 of those applicants were women, veterans, and socially and economically disadvantaged individuals. I'm proud to be one of the first recipients of the RRF grant. I applied at 11.30 a.m. before the portal was even supposed to be open. Um, I just checked and um, got my application in, but I'd spent days before that preparing. A lot of people in my position are having something like grantee guilt. Um, we feel really bad for having gotten a grant when so many others are still facing a terrifying and uncertain future without this grant. A friend of mine told me not to feel guilty, but to make my business healthy and then work tirelessly to ask Congress for more money for this program. So that's exactly what I intend to do. I believe that for every restaurant in the country to be made whole, the program could need as much as $140 billion more. This isn't reflected in the statistic because not every restaurant knows about the program and not everyone applied knowing that $28.6 billion would not be enough. So they simply gave up on this lifeline. Congressman Blumenauer, Congressman Fitzpatrick, Senator Sinema and Senator Wicker plan to introduce a bill soon to put more money into the RRF. The restaurant community could not be more thankful for these four heroes for standing up in our very darkest days. In closing, I wanna emphasize one last crucial point I sit here today, not on behalf of Garland, but to stand for the 11 million restaurant workers and 500,000 independent restaurants to say both thank you and more help is needed. Every single one of you has a struggling restaurant in their district and every single one of you will have some restaurants that do not get an RF grant for which they apply. Please help all restaurants look like post pandemic successes like Garland, knock on wood, and please add more money to the RRF. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. Thank you, Ms. Kumar. And Ms. Baru, now you are recognized for five minutes for your opening statement. Thank you. Uh, my name is Esther Baruch, and I'm here on behalf of the National Association of Theater Owners, representing movie theaters operating 90% of the movie screens across the United States. Uh, thank you, Chairman Phillips, Ranking Member Van Dyne, and members of the subcommittee for the opportunity to testify to you today regarding the Shuttered Venue Operators Grant Program, or SVOG. Uh, this program is a critical lifeline for movie theaters, live music venues, and arts organizations that were completely shuttered by the pandemic and are only now beginning to rebuild toward recovery. I'd like to open by thanking the many members of Congress, their staff, and the administration who were and are instrumental in standing up this program. We were thrilled to hear SBA Administrator Guzman say yesterday that SVOG awards have begun to go out. Our organization has not received any reports from our members about notification of grant awards, but we hope they will be imminent. A word about why movie theaters are so important to our culture and economy. Cinemas employ over 153,000 individuals nationwide and support and boost millions of additional jobs in surrounding retail and restaurants and the cinema supply chain. 96% of theater operators are small businesses. Movie going is one of the most affordable out of home activities and is especially popular among minority groups. Theaters were devastated by the pandemic. 96% of independent theater operators lost over 70% of revenue last year and those losses have continued into this year. Our industry lost 63% of jobs, although we're hopeful that these jobs will rebound as we continue to reopen. We deeply appreciate Congress's recognition of the difficulties our industry experienced by including us in the Save Our Stages Act, now known as the Shuttered Venue Operators Grant Program. We have every confidence that the SVOG program will help thousands of theater operators and other businesses and organizations to keep their doors open. Per the last updates from SBA, the number of grants and the funding amount requested track almost exactly with what we expected. In addition to being able to fund initial grants, this also means that there will be sufficient funding for supplemental grants as intended in the legislation, which we were also glad to hear the administrator confirm in her testimony yesterday. However, the implementation process has not been without some significant challenges. 
I refer the subcommittee to my full testimony for details on that. Today, I wanna to focus on two key issues, the first being the opportunity to appeal, and the second being the supplemental grants process. With regard to the opportunity to appeal, um, as the chairman mentioned, the SFOG, app, the SFOG program is complex and its, op its application is also complex. Um, it required reams of paperwork to complete. The good news is that we believe that because of this, the instances of fraud associated with the program will be extremely low. Um, the number of supporting documents required for the application should make it, frankly, virtually impossible for a non-qualified entity to apply. This also means, however, that there are many opportunities to make a mistake, um, especially since the SBA's guidance changed considerably and frequently as the program was set to open and change again, even after thousands of applications were submitted. Um, we are still waiting on clarification of certain outstanding questions that impact complete and correct applications. But unfortunately, applicants have no opportunity to cure their applications and very little information about what mistakes they may have made. We strongly urge the SBA to allow appeals. If eligible applicants are denied these grants, they will have no options left and their businesses and organizations will be forced to close permanently or go bankrupt. Second to ensuring that all eligible applicants are able to access initial grants, we also urge the SBA to move expeditiously on the supplemental grants process. These additional grants were made available by Congress because entities that experienced more than 70% of revenue loss in the first quarter of this year require additional funding to survive. We don't have an update from the SBA yet on this process, but the good news is that the application for the initial grant included all the information necessary to evaluate and process supplemental grants. So we hope that as soon as initial grants begin to be dispersed, the SBA will work on supplemental grants. I am confident that the SVOG program will do a lot of good. We urge the SBA to provide an opportunity to appeal and to get the supplemental process going so it's not subject to too much delay. Thank you again for the opportunity to testify and I welcome your questions. Thank you, Ms. Marouk. And next, uh, Mr. Montana, the next five minutes are yours. Uh, Mr. Chair and distinguished members of the committee, uh, unlike Previous testifiers, it may be less obvious why a distiller would be here uh, speaking to you from my distillery uh, discussing these programs. And it's because many distilleries, mine included, owe their continued existence uh, to the PPP, IDLE, and the RRF programs. In early March of 2020, I had a conversation with my cocktail room staff, and they told me that they didn't feel safe operating the cocktail room during COVID. Uh, I shut the cocktail room that night. More than 60% of Denard's revenue came from the cocktail room, and closing it likely meant the end of the business. To compound matters, two days later, the second blow came as all bars and restaurants closed. Our biggest customers are bars and restaurants, and their closure meant a significant blow to our small wholesale business. We're a break-even company, so losing 60 to 80% of our business was a death sentence. So we decided to go down swinging. We had alcohol and that's what was needed to make hand sanitizer. So we, like hundreds of other small distilleries and cities and communities across the country, pivoted to making hand sanitizer. Our initial batch was donated to police, letter carriers, meals on wheels, homeless shelters, and congregate care facilities. Later, we would find a market for the sanitizer and those sales helped us stay afloat and enabled us to continue donating sanitizer to those who needed it most. I'm proud to say that our sanitizer was distributed to nearly every child care center in the state of Minnesota at no cost to them. And through our partnership with other Twin Cities distilleries, we were able to donate tens of thousands of gallons of sanitizer to those who needed it most. While this story is, I believe, extraordinary, it could have been told by many other distillers across the country because they too responded when their community needed them and converted their stills and tanks to sanitizer production. They too are of their community and respond when their community needs them. Of the hundreds of distilleries nationwide that pivoted to sanitizer production, I don't know of a single one that did not donate substantial amounts. And after the events of 2020, I've never been prouder to call myself a distiller. And that is why it's so humbling to be given the honor to represent them here today. It's an honor that I previously held as a president of the American Craft Spirits Association. And in that role, I had an opportunity to learn from hundreds of distilleries across the country about the challenges they face. 
perhaps most enlightening was learning that, like me, most of them relied on their cocktail rooms to survive. The lifeblood of the American microdistillery has for many years been the cocktail room. It's a place where people can come and gather and buy our products that we make right there on site. And it's often our only opportunity to make a sale directly to our consumer. See, unlike most businesses, we're not typically allowed to sell directly to our consumer. We're required by law to sell to a distribution company that then sells to a retail company that then sells to the consumer. In fact, only a fraction of the price that you pay on the shelf makes it back to the distiller. So when these cocktail rooms had to close, because they, like other restaurants and bars, represented a substantial and unjustifiable risk of community spread of COVID-19, the industry took a body blow that I wasn't sure it could recover from. As is often the story with major disasters, big business is usually able to bounce back. They're well insured, well capitalized, their pockets run deep. Well, we don't have those deep pockets. So when a disaster strikes small businesses, we don't usually come back. And we did lose distilleries, but not as many as I would have thought in those moments in March. And it's because those businesses, like my business, were able to avail themselves of programs specifically designed to keep them afloat. We would not have made it to the point where we could make hand sanitizer without the infusion of capital we received by the payroll protection program. When those sales dried up in the absence of more than 70% of our business, the second payroll protection program, the idle loan, and the restaurant revitalization fund kept us going. And now as things begin to open up, the future is starting to look brighter. But at the time when the outlook was bleakest, our government gave us a hand much in the way that we gave our communities a hand when we switched to sanitizer production. If nothing else I say today sticks with this, with this committee, I hope that it will be this one thing. On behalf of the micro distilleries across the country, thank you for stepping up for us. When we stepped up for our communities, we didn't do it because we wanted a handshake or a pat on the back or a cookie. We did it because that's what you do. You use the resources that you have to do what you can to help the people who need helping. And I'm proud to say that that's what my government did too. The fact that my business has, has survived to reach today is traceable directly back to the PPP, IDLE, and Restaurant Revitalization programs. And I know there are many other micro distilleries across the nation who would say the same. So thank you for your time and for the honor of addressing this committee. Thank you, Mr. Montana. I think I speak for everybody when I say we would trade a cookie for a martini. With that, uh, Mr. McGuire, uh, the next five minutes are yours. Thank you, Chairman Phillips and uh, Ranking Member Van Dyne and the other members of the subcommittee. My name is Mark McGuire, and I'm the founder, co-owner, and managing partner of McGuire Restaurant Holdings and Core F&B in Dallas. We operate McGuire's Kitchen and Catering, a fine dining restaurant that opened in North Dallas in 1999, as well as two Gather Coffee Cafe locations, both of which are located in Ranking Member Van Dyne's district. Thank you for allowing me to testify today on behalf of my business, the National Restaurant Association, and the Texas Restaurant Association. I'd also like to thank the other witnesses who are testifying today as well. Your stories are compelling and the heartache is familiar. Each of our businesses is unique and I know we've all struggled mightily and are anxious to have the opportunity to rebuild. Like so many restaurants across the US, my businesses were severely impacted by COVID-19, even in Texas, where now we're allowed to operate at 100% and consumer demand is getting stronger by the day, we are far from normal. Ms. Kumar mentioned pivoting uh, and other witnesses have mentioned pivoting. I, I'm past the pivoting now and I'm into full pirouettes. Um, we're spinning like a top on a daily basis trying to deal with uh, these new obstacles uh, that are coming our way. Labor shortages, uh, product costs, increases in availability, supply chain chaos. Um, my example, since January of this year, in, in less than five months, we've had 40 to 50% increases on our proteins. Cooking oils are up over 50%, paper goods and to-go supplies up to 70% increases. What does this do to us? Well, um, as mentioned, we are, we are spinning like a top trying to keep up with it. I'll give you an example. During uh, the five years prior to the pandemic, uh, my uh, restaurant in North Dallas uh, had one menu price increase in those five years. Since March 20th of this year, we've had to increase our menu prices twice in five months. And that is not because we're finding a way to make a profit. We're just trying to find a way to keep our heads above the water. We haven't even come close to scratching out a profitable month since before this all began. 
Sadly, I know I'm not alone in this experience. Collectively, as mentioned, the restaurant industry has lost $290 billion in revenue during this pandemic. The relief programs that Congress has provided have been a lifeline to my business and many others. In fact, one of my restaurants was less than 30 days from total shutdown when we received our second PPP. So thank you very much. And the PPP worked exactly as Congress and SBA had intended. It provided immediate relief that allowed us to keep our people working and the lights on. But the PPP was always intended to provide short-term assistance. Nobody could possibly have seen how long this pandemic effect would last and how deeply it would cut into the American economy. But now my business and many other restaurants need relief that fits a pandemic that has created waves of challenges for 15 months and counting. We all hope that the Restaurant Revitalization Fund could be that solution. I believe it still can, if it is funded to provide the support for which it was created and intended for everyone who is in need. Last night, we learned that the SBA has received applications for about 75 billion in grants from a fund with 28.6 billion. That's easy math, 46 billion deficit. Unfortunately, my business are likely to fall within this deficit gap. Even though McGuire's had an incredibly difficult year, we didn't qualify for the RRF because of our PPP proceeds. My two cafes do qualify, but they don't meet any of the priority classifications. So without additional funding, the RRF uh, assistance is unlikely to come my way. I know there's a bipartisan commitment to the RRF within Congress, so I'm hopeful the funding deficit and eligibility concerns can be remedied. Our flagship McGuire's Kitchen is seeing numbers increase every week, but we're still digging out from a deep deficit. And with so much chaos in the supply chain and instability in the labor market, we are counting on the RRF to provide some runway to allow us to work through this new minefield and get to a point where we can actually manage and plan proactively to rehire and rebuild. If my RRF is funded, for example, for my cafes, I'll be able to reopen the one cafe that's been closed since October and bring back as many as 14 to 16 uh, Texans into the work for workforce. Finally, I'll just add that restaurants are more than a business. It's true we employ a lot of people and that's important to our economy, but it's also true that we play an important role in our communities. Just consider all of the interactions you have had at restaurants and venues with business associates, friends, and family over the years. Can you imagine life without that? A sincere thanks to this committee, the SBA, and other members of Congress who have worked to continue with bipartisan focus to provide programs that have been immeasurably helpful to my businesses, as well as many others across the country. I appreciate your leadership and ongoing support. Thank you so much for allowing me to testify. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Mr. McGuire. And to all of our witnesses, I just wanna to say too that uh, to the two of you who are in the restaurant business uh, as the co-owner of three coffee shops in Minneapolis uh, uh, who did not uh, uh, solicit or accept PPP money, I can empathize, uh, deeply empathize uh, with the struggles you're facing, uh, know them firsthand and um, rest assured, I, my committee joins me uh, in trying to assist all of you. Uh, I'll start the questioning uh, with myself for five minutes and recognize myself. Uh, and my first question is to you, Mr. Montana. Uh, the Restaurant Revitalization Fund, as we all know, had an initial 21-day period, priority period, for grants to women-owned businesses, veteran-owned businesses, and other socially and or economically disadvantaged small business concerns. Uh, reports from the SBA indicate that the program received almost 150,000 applications, 147,000. Uh, from these priority groups requesting more than $29 billion in relief funds. Uh, so given the unique challenges face, facing such communities and business owners, uh, please share some, some perspectives with the committee about why you believe that priority period was an important part of this grant program. Uh, thank you for the question. Um, I think it, you know, I would first go back to our experience with the PPP and the experience that I, I know is shared from a number of my colleagues, um, we weren't able to get the PPP the first time that we uh, attempted. Uh, and we didn't exactly know why we would later find out that you needed to have uh, some deeper rooted connections um, and longer running uh, established relationships with banks. And then that's not the case for a number of, of particularly minority owned 
businesses, myself included. And so I think that instead of having history repeat itself, it was important to make sure that this fund got that piece right. And I, so I do think that it made sense. Um, I know that it has helped us significantly. Um, again, I wouldn't be standing here. This place wouldn't be open, but for those funds. And I think that the, the, real, the real challenge here is not so much to focus on the fact that instead of being left out again, uh, this population did get a chance, a fair chance at those funds. I think instead the focus should be on how can we make sure that everyone uh, now gets that same access. And so I would hope uh, the funds have have helped me in such a way that, and, I, and I'm fortunate, I've, I've received them. Um, I would hope that everyone else gets the same opportunity. And so I really do hope that this, that this committee and this Congress finds a way to fully fund the program. All right. Thank you, Mr. Montana. Uh, Ms. Baruch, uh, creating and standing up uh, multi-billion dollar programs such as this one is no small pet task. Uh, our agencies were ill-prepared, uh, poorly staffed, and a resource to do so, of course. Uh, but the SBA has worked hard to build an online application portal, as you know, and, and worked uh, with the private sector to manage uh, the tools and technology uh, to make the application process uh, at least reasonably successful. Uh, the SBA also created education and outreach materials, as we all know, uh, worked with resource partners and engaged with stakeholders to ensure that eligible entities uh, were aware of the program requirements and were prepared to apply for the program. So perhaps you could share with the committee about how your engagement uh, with the SBA during the process has gone, uh, and have they been forthcoming in your estimation with information, updates, uh, and support? We welcome your perspective. Uh, Congressman, thank you so much for the question um, and for acknowledging that, yes, SVOG has been a complex uh, program to stand up, and, and we know that many people at the SBA have been working hard. Um, you know, the SBA um, was very forthright with stakeholders early on in the process that they wanted our feedback, um, and we worked really hard to provide that feedback. As they issued frequently asked questions every week, we responded with updates, questions about the questions. Um, feedback that we were getting from our members in the field. So we tried to be a resource to the SBA. You know, as you had mentioned, there are a lot of entities that qualify for this program and we're all a little bit different and our requirements are all a little bit different. So I know that we at NATO and the other stakeholder groups all tried to be resources to SBA, provide them with, with as much information as we could about, you know, the specific intricacies of our industries um, and how the program should be stood up correctly so that as many eligible entities as possible could access it. Um, the SBA has held a number of stakeholder meetings um, since you know, April 8th and onward. Um, and we would just urge the SBA to keep maintaining those open lines of communication uh, to maintain two-way communication with the stakeholders. You know, let us continue to be a resource to them. You know, when we report questions from the field or ambiguities or things that have come up, to continue to engage with us directly um, so that we can make sure that our members have correct and complete applications um, and get access to this funding. Thank you, Ms. Baruch. Uh, you know, I was going to, well, you know, it looks like my time is, is winding down. So uh, with that, I will uh, yield uh, to Ms. Van Dyne, who is now recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much, Chairman Phillips. Um, McGuire, you know, your written testimony, you talked about the additional weight of inflation on your business. You talked about the poultry increases by 40%, meat over 30% increase, cooking oils at 50% increase. In addition to these um, inflationary pressures, do you see anything coming out of Washington that could further pump the brakes on your business, say in the tax or regulatory realm? Well, uh, that's a pretty broad-based question. And, and the answer to it I'll give you is, is broad-based as well. Now is not the time for anything coming out of Washington to uh, uh, provide any kind of a negative impact on our P&Ls um, and taxes uh, are included. Any regulatory, um, any regulatory demands or, or actions that come from DC right now that uh, in any way um, put a financial or operational or regulatory burden on our businesses, now is not the time for that. Okay. Um, you know, earlier this week, uh, uh, Chairman, uh, this subcommittee, Dean Phillips, and I introduced the Bipartisan Restaurant Recovery Fairness Act to ensure that only proper entities receive funding under the multi-billion dollar program. Safeguarding American taxpayer dollars will remain a high priority for me. 
Um, it was great to see in your testimony that you mentioned program integrity. Would you agree that a balanced approach to unoversight that doesn't create burdens, as you were mentioning earlier, but rather safeguards and oversees the program would be beneficial? Absolutely. I, I think that integrity in the program is obviously something that uh, is, is extremely important, and I would fully support that. My experience with uh, the PPP and the RRF has been pretty positive from uh, the standpoint uh, that I'm qualified to comment on how to establish integrity in developing these programs, but uh, certainly the uh, the application process and the documentation that's been required along with the required documentation for forgiveness has been uh, substantial and very thorough. And I feel pretty pretty good about uh, the way this these programs have been set up and the integrity that's been established to ensure that uh, they are properly, um, properly followed. I appreciate that. Um, and listening to your testimony and from talking to business owners just across this district, um, it's clear that the enhanced unemployment benefits have had a very large negative impact and effect on small employers' ability to hire staff. In fact, yesterday I called one of our local barbecue places that I've been to a number of times over several decades, and they actually had a voice greeting that said they were closed due to a national labor shortage. Um, can you speak to what you're seeing in the workforce? I can't, I can't go to any restaurant, honestly, that is open fully because they don't have the staff. What are you seeing? Well, we're, we're no different. We're in the same boat. Um, we are lucky in Texas that we have been open 100% and we have seen a strong uh, return in consumer demand. And there have been nights that our restaurants have had to go on weights. And they've gone on weights with empty tables. And the reason they've gone on weights with empty tables is not because of social distancing requirements. It's, it's because we don't have the staff to service them. Uh, that's definitely uh, a knife in the back considering what we're trying to climb our way out of. And the labor issue is real. Um, it's real for many reasons. Um, one, the way the unemployment benefits have been structured, but uh, there's a lot of other factors that are involved that are, are making it challenging to get employees back into our business. We lost a lot of people out of our industry to other industries uh, during this crisis because we couldn't provide uh, the jobs and there were other industries that were thriving during the, the, the pandemic that they moved into. And so now we've got to try to find a way to get them back into our business. Um, and we're doing that by creating opportunities for uh, for high wages and for flexible schedules and for great work cultures. And uh, that's on us to provide to uh, entice those people back to our industry. I appreciate that. Okay, time for just one more quick question. What's your experience been on with the RFF thus far? And can you compare your experience with the Restaurant Revitalization Fund to your experience with PPP? Well, uh, my experience has been vastly different. Um, the PPP, while it was new to everybody uh, the first time, certainly by the second uh, time, everybody had a, a pretty good understanding of, of the process and, and the documentation that was involved. And uh, the portals that, uh, that I applied through were uh, very communicative in regards to uh, letting me know where in the process my application stood. Uh, the RRF was uh, <clears throat> much more difficult. I think the, uh, uh, the um, information that was put out as far as uh, how to how to complete the application and what documentation was necessary was pretty confusing to me until uh, the National Restaurant Association produced a document that kind of walked us through step by step. Uh, so we got through the application process, but now uh, my application was submitted on May the 4th and it's been sitting in a under review status uh, for the last uh, 22 days, 23 days. And I have not been able to get any kind of idea or communication from anybody as to the status of that application. Although I do know that because I don't fit any of the priority classifications, it's very unlikely that I'll see any money unless this thing is funded. All right, thank you. Uh, yeah, your time's expired. Uh, thank you, Ranking Member Van Dyne. Uh, and now we'll turn to the gentle lady from California, Ms. Chu, for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Uh, oh, Ms. Baruch, uh, movie theaters and live venues were among the first businesses to close their doors at the start of the pandemic and will be amongst the last to reopen. 
That's why I'm so concerned about the SVOG delays, especially as theaters like the Arclight in Pasadena, which is in my district, have recently closed for good. I know that our top priority must be getting funds out the door to struggling businesses, but we also have to ensure that the program's rules are written in a way that will allow eligible entities to get through the application process smoothly. So as a means of the way, uh, as a member of the Ways and Means Committee, I'm also concerned about the way the tax structure of these theaters might impact their eligibility for relief programs. Specifically, I understand that there, there that there's a form 4506T required by SBA that poses serious challenges for theater owners with multiple locations. So could you expand on these concerns and talk about how we can ensure the application process works for all eligible entities, including theaters? Thank you so much, Congresswoman. And yes, we were devastated um, for the loss of the Arclight Pacific theaters that closed because of the circumstances of the pandemic and probably because some of the SVOG funding just, you know, it just hasn't arrived quickly enough. Um, with regard to the tax issues that you mentioned in the 4506T form, yes, it's a very complex form. Um, this form was required by the SBA so that the IRS could pull applicant tax returns um, so that they could be used to verify applicant identity and revenue streams. Um, the SBA actually revised the guidance to the 4506T after many thousands of people had submitted their applications. Um, and unfortunately, their guidance is so incomplete. Um, there are entities that are organized as disregarded entities um, for the purpose of tax filing who cannot fill out the 4506T form um, per the guidance of the SBA. And what this means is if they can't file the 4506T, SVOG. And so what we really need the SBA to do, and we have flagged this with them, is to put out the full guidance about all the various tax types that are eligible for this program, that the SBA has made eligible for this program, so that everybody who is eligible can get their application in, have it be complete, and get the funding flowing. So I would be glad to work with you and your team on the specific tweaks that we need to see in the guidance um, so that we can get these correct 4506Ts in as quickly as possible. Yeah, we'd certainly like to work with you on that. Um, and also, uh, Ms. Baruch, you mentioned in your testimony that SVOG applicants will not have the opportunity to appeal if their application is rejected by SBA, even if it is for a reason outside of their control, like these Form 5506T issues that you just talked about. So as chair of the subcommittee in the last Congress, I was closely monitoring SBA's response to fraud risks in pandemic programs. And I do appreciate the level of care that they took um, and that they are taking to reduce fraud. But we also have to ensure that eligible small businesses are still able to fully participate in the program, especially industries that are as hard hit as yours. So could you elaborate on why you support an appeals process, give us an example of, of why this is needed and discuss how SBA can implement such a program uh, without increasing fraud risk in it. Sure, thank you, Congresswoman. And I just wanna state, you know, we also support the goal to reduce and prevent fraud. It would be um, terrible, frankly, if this funding ended up in the hands of the wrong entities. Um, we think it's really important to have an appeals process for a couple of reasons. One is that there were technical issues associated with the application, and I'll give you a couple examples of that. Um, this sounds small, but if you uploaded a document, you couldn't delete it. So there, you know, the little trash can icon didn't work. So if you uploaded a document by mistake, you couldn't delete it, and there were a limited number of slots of documents that you could upload. So Virtually everything as part of the application required documentation to prove it. Um, so again, if you couldn't delete a wrong document, you know, we don't know that a reviewer is going to understand that this was just a mistake. So that's from the technical side. From the policy side, um, even going into the application, you know, after we, you know, after the SBA redid all the guidance and reopened the portal, there were still a bunch of issues that were very ambiguous. Um, among them, you know, how you should fill out the date your, your entity began operations. If you opened after January 1, 2019, um, your grant amount might calculate incorrectly if you didn't have the right date 
um, in that box, but the guidance on how to fill it out was very ambiguous. Um, and so I know that we have members who probably had their applications miscalculate their grant amount because of this ambiguity. So given that we had technical issues and policy issues, all of this is explainable, right? As soon as two people can have a dialogue about it, you can explain it and understand it and fix it. So we would just really ask the SBA to provide that opportunity so that these mistakes, which were you know, just errors um, that people made because of ambiguities or technical problems could be rectified and they can still get the grant. And again, without in any way infringing on any fraud issues. Uh, the gentlelady's time has expired. Uh, I just ask everybody, uh, committee members and, and witnesses to try to uh, keep track of the time if you might. Uh, with that, I recognize the fellow gentleman from Minnesota, Mr. Hagedorn, for five minutes. Chairman, thank you. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks for holding this hearing. I'm gonna direct the first part of my remarks to Mr. McGuire, if I could. Uh, yesterday, sir, we were able to discuss these issues with the SBA administrator, Ms. Guzman. And I talked with her about the Restaurant Revitalization Fund and how the, the uh, Democrats with President Biden and the members of Congress decided to have a priority group that included every single type of uh, bar and restaurant owner except people who happen to be white men. And I, I asked her also about how if she could assure us that uh, illegal aliens were not receiving funds through the Restaurant Revitalization Fund before U.S. citizens. Uh, and in both cases, first of all, she couldn't really explain how it wasn't discriminatory or racist to exclude uh, white men from the process, the initial process, which now there's no funding left for anybody else and that who wasn't part of the priority group. And secondarily, she couldn't really assure us that uh, illegal aliens weren't receiving these monies before U.S. citizens. So I'm not going to ask you to comment on any of that because, you know, clearly you see where I'm coming from. But I'll ask you, you're a business owner, you're a restaurant owner, you understand all the competitive natures of your business. You've seen what everyone in the industry has gone through the last year. As a member of Congress, I think our goal is to make sure everybody gets treated equally that we get all businesses, all restaurants and bars from one side of the coronavirus to the other, and that I don't think we should be picking winners and losers here. But as, as a person in the business, it would be a big competitive advantage for your neighbor who has a similar business to get money from the government and you to be shut out simply because you didn't fit on their priority list, correct? Well, uh, I would agree with you from the standpoint that I'm disappointed that it doesn't look like I'm going to have an opportunity uh, at this time to receive any funding. Um, however, uh, my take on that is, is that it has very little to do with uh, how the program was structured and everything to do with how the program was funded. Um, there wasn't enough money to fund uh, all of the priority classifications alone. Um, so we didn't even get past the get through the priority classifications, whether I fit into them or not. Um, had I been a white male veteran, I would have been in that in that priority classification. Um, unfortunately, I didn't have an opportunity to serve my country. But uh, to me, the problem is funding, and it's been funding since day one. It's something that we've been uh, trying to work through um, right from the beginning on this. I think everybody knew that 28.6 billion, while it's a gigantic number was not gonna even make a dent in what was needed for this. And we clearly saw within 21 days that it's probably gonna end up being less than a quarter of what was needed. So hopefully uh, we can find a way to get back to the drawing board and find a way to get the funding for everybody that needs it. Because whether you're in that priority class or not, if you need it, you need it. I need it. So the, uh, to reclaim my time. So the actually, actually the priority list was almost completely funded by the interest of dollars. Uh, Representative Van Dyne, our ranking Republican, did mention that Republicans offered an amendment to put another $20 billion into the program that was rejected, unfortunately, by the majority. I also would like to associate my comments with uh, Representative Van Dyne, who was talking about unemployment compensation and how it's especially uh, hurting, uh, you know, getting labor for this uh, sector of the economy. I talk with business owners, especially restaurant bar owners across the district here in southern Minnesota all the time, and this extra $300 a weak federal unemployment compensation is a deterrent for people to return for work. Uh, representatives Emmer, Stauber, Fishbach, and myself, from Minnesota, wrote our governor a letter a couple of weeks ago uh, asking that he join about 20 to 25 governors across the 
the country in order to reject that extra money and have incentives to get people back to work. Also in Minnesota, we're encouraging our governor to reopen our state, give up his emergency powers, and make sure that we can get all businesses and schools fully operational with, get with kids back in school because that'll free up people to, to get back to work uh, and not be at home all the time taking care of the kids. So it just seems to be kind of common sense in those areas. But with that, I'll yield back. The gentleman yields back, and now I recognize uh, Ms. Davis uh, from Kansas, uh, the chairwoman of the uh, Economic Growth Tax and Capital Access Subcommittee of the Small Business Committee. Ms. Davis, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Phillips. Um, and thanks for holding this hearing today to focus on uh, some of the newest SBA relief programs that we're uh, seeing for our small businesses. And it's been referenced a couple of times already. Yesterday, we held a, a full committee hearing with Administrator uh, Guzman. And uh, I know I asked her about the need to provide additional funds for the restaurant revitalization uh, restaurant revitalization fund. I, I, the, obviously, the RF is um, oversubscribed at this point. Um, and I have appreciated some of the comments um, by... Uh, Mr. McGuire about the need to, to properly fund the program. And also I know uh, Ms. Kumar uh, in, in your testimony uh, mentioned the uh, impact of the restaurant relief funds. I'm, I'm curious if uh, one or both of you, I'd love to hear from um, both of you about how, um, you know, the return to things like uh, greater indoor capacity, like really fully opening up, um, uh, is is impacting you and what the RF can do about that. But also, kind of fundamentally looking forward, um, I know Mr. McGuire, you actually talked a bit about the uh, none of us expected this to go on this long, and and now we're seeing like we we need to be thinking about addressing this as um, this. You know, we're. 16, 18 months, we're like, this is going to uh, impact us for a while. Can you talk a little bit about the, um, just how you're planning for that and, and what you think the uh, RRF needs to look like and how we need to adapt? Well, uh, I think the, the, the most challenging word in that whole commentary was planning. And, uh, there really is just no such thing as that. I've been in this business since I was 18 years old. I've managed, uh, you know, or owned or operated for 35 years. I've, I've managed P&Ls that whole time. Um, I've never seen anything like this in my entire career. Um, the, the price increases that we've seen in the last 45 days are uh, unprecedented, and there's no playbook for, for how to deal with this. Uh, what I'm looking for from the RRF is to provide um, financial support that will allow a runway for us to get to the point where we can start planning and being strategic in what we do. Because right now there's really, um, it is, I'm not exaggerating when I say I wake up and say, okay, what's coming my way today? And what are my prices on this? And am I going to have to change my menu? And will I be able to offer everything? And am I going to have enough staff to meet the demand of the, of the consumer? And that is a daily issue. That is not something that any of us have ever had to deal with. Um, thank you for that. Uh, I just want to state that, yes, our restaurant is open for indoor dining now. We're still practicing safety, but it's not as simple as just unlocking our doors and going back to the way things were. I don't think things are going to be the same for a really long time. And the grant money, you know, the, the period that um, it covers, the expenses are covered from February of 2020 till March of 2023. So while the grant uh, awards might seem large and the fund seems, uh, you know, it sounds like it's a lot of money and it is, um, we are, you know, required to plan and planning again is is the operative word. We can't go back to the same um, way of doing business. We have thousands of dollars that we owe to our landlords, for example, if we were lucky enough to reach a deferred um, agreement with them. Um, you know, a lot of us still owe money to our suppliers and um, a lot of people took out idle loans that, you know, they're going to be making payments for 30 years because of this pandemic that, you know, 
put us in a situation that was like no fault of our own. And in the best of times before the pandemic, our profit margins were six to 9% in a really good year, like 9%, we were jumping up and down with joy. And now, um, you know, we're seeing again, higher supplier costs. Um, and we're all, you know, myself in our company, we're committed to much higher uh, wages for our employees and to make this a sustainable career for people to come back to, to lure them back to work. I know a lot of people really wanted to stay in the industry, but they just simply couldn't afford to do it. And, um, you know, that's an expensive commitment that we're willing to make, but we do need the support in order to sustain uh, this industry and make it a viable um, place for people to be employed. Yeah, thank you for that. And um, just really quickly, Ms. Uh, Baruch, I'm, we're going to follow up with you about some of the commentary that you made earlier. Uh, obviously, it's a huge issue if disregarded entities are being uh, having hurdles the way they are uh, to, to get access to the programs. Thank you so much. Uh, Chairman, I yield back. Thank you, Ms. Davids. And next, I recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Dan Muser, the ranking member of the Economic Growth Tax and Capital Access Subcommittee. Uh, I recognize you now, Dan, for five minutes. Thank you, uh, Chairman Phillips. I appreciate that very much. And R Ranking Member Van Dyne for holding this hearing. And I certainly thank all of you witnesses uh, for being with us today, which is very likely a nice day in uh, Texas and North Carolina and the other places that you are. So appreciate it. Uh, and for your testimony, that is uh, has a a touch of optimism to it, but but a lot of reality because that's what that's what business is all about. A lot of reality. There's no there's no fooling yourself in business. If you do, you go out of business. So, um, hey, Mr. McGuire, um, I'd like to being that you are in Texas, and uh, Miss Miss Kumar, you're in North Carolina. Your know, experience here in Pennsylvania has been has been pretty rough now for small businesses for uh, uh, restaurants. We went, um, we were at 25% capacity from January 4th through April 4th, 25% indoor capacity. Uh, on April 4th, we went to 50% capacity. And um, on May 31st, we'll, we will go to 75% capacity. So, or, or check that, since April 5th, we've been in 75% capacity. So as you could see, restaurants in particular uh, were, were hit hardest. Our small businesses were hit pretty hard too, but of course PPP was was very very important. And my guess is, and from your testimonies and statements, that uh, you all were able to gain PPP. Now, I also know that restaurants have um, some part time employees, and so the PPP wasn't very significant. Even though in PPP two we increased it to uh, to a two point five percent ratio. So I know that was helpful, but that's why the RRF was so essential. And we allocated 27.5 billion, I, I believe. And with, with, with uh, prioritization, that's all well and good, if there would have been enough to go around, if you will, and there definitely wasn't. In my district, I have virtually every restaurant I hear from has not received the RRF. And we, um, uh, uh, not to uh, point fingers, but we did, Republicans did ask for an amendment of it and added $20 billion to the RRF fund, uh, which uh, did not get um, passed, did not get accepted. Now, of course, we are trying to find additional funds for the RRF, which is, uh, which are very, very important. So that, that will continue. Now, I would like to just ask, um, let me start with um, uh, uh, Chidi Kumar, if I can. Uh, Ms. Kumar, you described your experience, but where, where are you now with, um, you said the PPP was very helpful, the uh, RRF was there for you. Um, how are you as a percentage of where you'd like to be or where you were prior to the uh, pandemic? Um, thank you for that. Our um, company suffered a 70% reduction in revenue from the start of the pandemic until now. Uh, we've been operating uh, with indoor dining and maintain our patio and, you know, we're, we're seeing definitely increased revenue, but 
um, it's going to take us many, many, many months to um, get back to the, the original level of revenue that we had before. And so three or four weeks of, of good restaurant business doesn't really cover 15 months of extreme mm -hmm. losses. Um, and it's going to be probably, I mean, I don't foresee seeing a profit uh, this year, this calendar year. Um, my husband is my partner and, you know, we're uh, still drawing a really conservative salary. We didn't pay ourselves at all um, until PPP2. And we're um, projecting making maybe $45,000 a year, um, you know, as a, as a guaranteed salary, if we're lucky, if there are no more, um, you know, dips in the roller coaster. Yeah. And so, you know, we don't have amnesia about what's happened already in the last year. So we're kind of bracing ourselves and holding on to that money and being very yeah. conservative minded about sure. how we spend that money in the coming months. Okay. And and as far as government assistance, that's somewhat in the rearview mirror now, right? I mean, we're in recovery mode. And so now, but at least government, you don't want government giving you any additional headwinds, uh, such as the unemployment compensation we know is going until September. Is that uh, a negative? Uh, is that a little bit of a headwind for you? Or what's your thoughts there? Well, um, for me in North Carolina, the average unemployment um, benefit for e even with the federal assistance is less than $500 a week. And for our restaurant, that's not a competitive uh, deterrent okay. for people to come back to work. We offer a, a living wage and we're proud to do so. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I don't, for us personally, we're not a low wage, hour yeah. part time kind of uh, that's restaurant. That's great. Um, I appreciate and, that. That's good. That's very good to hear. It truly is. Uh, uh, Mr. McGuire, your thoughts on the on the UC supplement? Mr. Muser, your time has expired. I'm sorry. Um, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, and now I recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Donalds, for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you to the ranking member. <clears throat> um, first of all, I just want to associate myself with the comments of Mr. Muser. And, and the ranking member, uh, specifically when it comes to uh, the fact that we did try to put more money uh, into the restaurant fund. And we all know what happened on the committee, so we'll just move on. Uh, but real quick, Mr. McGuire, I know uh, Representative Muser had a question for you. So I actually would like to just allow, allow you to give you time to answer Representative Muser's uh, previous question. Uh, the question regarding the uh, headwind caused by, or potentially caused by the, the UI benefit? Yeah. Well, uh, as, a, as I mentioned before, um, you know, it's certainly uh, a component of what is uh, contributing to the labor shortage. There's no doubt about that. Um, I can give you very specific examples within, uh, within my staff uh, that has uh, chosen to uh, continue working uh, or not working and uh, uh, collecting the UI benefit. However, there are some considerations there that um, are um, or beyond their control. And, and what I've told them is, look, you know, when I need you back to work, uh, you're going to have to come back to work, um, or I can't guarantee that I'm going to give you a job. But the bottom line is right now, uh, UI is a huge contributor to the labor shortage. Um, people moving out of our industry is a huge contributor to the labor shortage. Uh, people not being able to get uh, childcare coverage um, to, to work the hours we want them to is a huge contributor. Um, and, and these issues are, are, are ongoing and, and we're gonna to have to collectively find a way to work together to, to overcome them. But the UI benefits um, certainly need to be uh, addressed. All right, uh, thanks for that. Uh, real quick, I, I wanna jump into a couple of things because obviously, you know, we could talk about what the programs have been. I understand that, that they've been helpful to the enterprises that have been able to take advantage of it. Um, but we're also having to consider new policies that are coming down. Uh, so, you know, Mr. Montana, I wanna ask you real briefly, um, you know, considering uh, the administration's uh, putting out the idea of raising uh, income, raising uh, corporate income taxes, um, and also their policy that they wanted to put through of raising the uh, minimum wage, the federal minimum wage, fifteen dollars an hour. What would be the impacts of that on your enterprise, Representative uh, Donald? Thanks for the question. Um, so. As to the minimum wage, uh, there's no one who works for Denard Craft Spirits that makes the minimum wage. They all make more than the minimum wage, and that's on purpose because we want people 
to have a living wage. And it's in large part because of that, that we don't have any kind of a labor shortage. We have people who are trying to come back. Um, I think people should like their jobs um, and not not just uh, have to work their jobs. The other side of that, uh, when you talk about the, the tax implications, one thing to keep in mind when you think about, you know, I'm coming to you from a distillery. This is a unique perspective. Many distilleries are in a growth phase. Um, which is a polite way of saying that most of us lose money. Um, and so when we are looking at uh, income taxes, well, that's not really where we pay our taxes. We pay our taxes and excise taxes. So we pay a tax just to be able to sell. Um, and so that that's where the tax burden typically is for us. But I'm not particularly concerned about the, the percentages moving up or down um, here or there. That's not what holds my business back. What's holding my business back is that I'm required by law to use uh, middleman, and I don't have a route to my customer. Um, and so if someone is looking to help out my business, a craft distillery, uh, make it so that way I can sell just like anybody else directly to my customer. And the day that that happens, you're going to see distilleries, you know, take it to the next level and really thrive in this country. All right. Uh, Mr. McGuire, uh, real quick, I got about a minute left. Uh, you stated in your written testimony that you've only raised prices once in six years. You've had to raise it twice in the last year. Uh, you know, you have 52 seconds. Why? Why have I had to raise them twice? Yes, sir. Why? Because of the unprecedented increases in our product costs in the last 45 days. We didn't see uh, 10 to 15 percent increases on any of our product costs during the pandemic outside of the uh, paper and to-go supplies and the PPE equipment and supplies. Um, our commodity pricing has gone absolutely berserk in the last two and a half months and really in the last... Mr. McGuire, real quick, real quick, because uh, I got now 24 seconds. Uh, what have your suppliers said in relation to these price increases? Uh, most of the suppliers are saying it's a it's happening at the manufacturing level and the manufacturing level is happening because of uh, labor shortages. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. McGuire. Thank you, Mr. Donalds. And are there any other members that wish to continue to a second round of, of questioning? If so, just raise your hand either virtually or physically. Nobody. Okay. Well, I just I want to thank I want to thank our, our witnesses. Um, you know, uh, I learned a lot from each of you, um, uh, Mr. Montana. You know, having come from the distilling business, I surely understand what that three tier system <laughs> does and doesn't do, uh, and I understand efficiencies and inefficiencies. Uh, to all of you in hospitality, uh, rest assured, uh, a great deal of empathy uh, from all of us. Um, so I want to thank you. Uh, you've all endured a lot over the last year, and the effort uh, just to get to this day uh, is nothing short of, of incredible to me. Uh, your testimony has illuminated the benefits and drawbacks of the SBA programs as they currently operate uh, and illuminated some ways that we can improve them. Uh, hopefully, we won't have to do this again uh, to this magnitude, uh, but should we, we'll be better prepared, and we have opportunities to improve existing programs, perpetual programs as well. Uh, as the voice of small businesses in Washington, uh, this committee has to work to improve these programs uh, to meet the needs of entrepreneurs better, plain and simple. So I look forward to working with uh, fellow members of the subcommittee on a bipartisan basis to help find ways to make these programs operate more effectively and more efficiently. I would ask for unanimous consent that members have five legislative days to submit statements and supporting materials for the record. And without objection, that is so ordered. Uh, if there is no further business to come before the committee, uh, we are now officially adjourned. Thanks, everybody. Thank you.
Instead of breeze, you gotta keep off the doorstep of the Senator. But it only fuels the fire, man. Let's fight even more. Yeah. Now, eight months later, closing in on holiday, we can say with confidence we got our 10K. had enough and you know what we're at the point where we're saying no idol grant or loan no idol no peace no idol no peace no idol no peace no idol no peace now is the perfect time to click that like and subscribe button and thank you for watching speak to you no peace no idol no peace. No, I don't know 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 pe